morning, everybody. Crazy week or what? I mean, right? Like last Sunday, coronavirus was just kind of on the fringes of our conversation, and it's like somebody threw a switch on Wednesday, and now it seems like it's the only thing that any of us are talking about. And, and it's created this wide spectrum of emotional responses, right? I mean, from anxiety and fear bordering on panic on one end of the spectrum, and then on the other end, just kind of angry and frustrated at the perceived overreaction of some people. And I think most of us are kind of in the middle, scratching our heads, wondering what is really going on. But I want you to know this morning, whether you're here at one of our campuses or watching online, whatever you're feeling this morning, it is okay to feel what you're feeling. We want you to know you are not alone. God is still sovereign. He is still on the throne. He is in control. And his plan and his purposes will not be stopped by some virus. Right? It's okay to feel what you're feeling. But for us as Christ followers, it's not okay to be controlled by those feelings, by those fears. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, not our own, not our government, not health officials, a power that comes from trusting in Him. So I just want to encourage you, we don't know what the next day, the next week, the next month is going to hold, but we know who holds the future, and we trust in Him. And I am convinced that His promise that he is working in and through every situation in our world, in our lives, and that his promise is that he can and will bring good out of it and get glory from it. And I'm convinced that this is an opportunity for us as the church to live out our faith in a way that truly helps the people around us. Because through our faith and trust in Jesus, living in that peace that he provides, our calmness will bring calmness to the people around us. Our faith will be a great testimony to who our Jesus is. And so we're in this series called Be the Church. This is a great opportunity for us to truly be the church. So I'm so glad you're here this morning. I want you to know you are not alone. Whatever happens, we're going to go through this together as a church family. I love you. I'm thankful for you. And I can't wait to see how God does amazing things in the weeks ahead. So just wanted to talk about that for a little bit. And then I want to ask you to go ahead and take out your message notes because we are going to continue to talk about what it means to be the church. And I'm going to begin this morning with a nursery rhyme. Maybe you remember this from your childhood. Here we go. Here is the church, here is the steeple, open the doors and what? Here's all the people. Yeah, many of you learned that. And at the risk of offending your Nana who taught that rhyme to you, I just need to tell you up front, that nursery rhyme is a bold-faced lie. Here's why I say that. Because this isn't the church. With or without a steeple, this is the church. The church is the people. We are the church. Today we are the church gathered. When we leave here, we'll be the church scattered. But either way, we are still the church. It's interesting that the one and only time that Jesus used the word church in the Gospels was in his conversation with Peter. Peter had just confessed Jesus as Lord, the Messiah. And Jesus' response was, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. It's interesting that the word Jesus used there for church was not the word for temple or tabernacle, which for the Hebrew mind would have been what they understood as the place where God is, the place where God lives. The word Jesus used is the Greek word ekklesia, which literally means a group of people called out specifically by God 
and bound to one another by a common purpose and their love for him. Jesus' view of the church has always been that is, is the people. And so that should always be how we see the church. And this slogan, don't just go to church, be the church, is a reminder that we are the church. And since we are the church, Jesus has said that we are to gather, to grow, and to go. To be the church means we are to gather, to connect with each other. And as we gather, we are to grow, not only numerically, but also spiritually. And as we grow, we are to go and take the good news of the gospel to the people and the world around us. And so today, what I want to do is spend a little time drilling down on this second key element of being the church, and that is growth. Being the church requires us to grow. Last month in our Better Together series, we talked a lot about spiritual growth, and we talked about how we help each other grow spiritually. In our connections, in our home groups, we help each other grow through encouraging each other, holding each other accountable, studying the Bible together, helps us get different perspectives of God's truth. All of those are great ways that we grow, but they're all external ways. They're all about how we demonstrate or live out our faith. Today, what I want to do is look at an inward aspect of growth, growing a heart like Jesus. And here's why, because true spiritual growth is not just behavior modification, it is heart transformation. And that's what God desires, hearts that are after his own heart. In fact, look at what he says in 2 Chronicles 16.9. It says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So this morning, I want, how do we get that? How do we get hearts fully committed to him? How do we grow a heart like Jesus? Four things that can help us be the church by developing a heart like Jesus. You ready? Number one, the first thing we have to do is care about what he cares about. To grow a heart like Jesus, we have to care about the things that Jesus cares about. That's obvious. That's the start, starting point, right? That the things that are important to Jesus need to be important to us. The things that move Jesus to action need to move us to action. In fact, look at what the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 2. This is from the Living Bible paraphrase. It says, be full of love, following the example of Christ who loved you. And notice, this is how he demonstrated that love. He gave himself to God as a sacrifice to take away your sins. I want you to circle the word gave and sacrifice. That's the example that Jesus gives us. Not just caring, but acting based on what we care about. When I say the word caring, most of us think of either sympathy or empathy, right? Sympathy is recognizing what somebody else is going through and then just acknowledging what they're feeling. Empathy is a little bit deeper. Empathy is feeling what they feel, that their pain hurts you, that their joy brings joy to you. Empathy and sympathy are good things, but having a heart like Jesus requires compassion. That is the deepest form of caring because compassion is what moves us to action. So what does Jesus care most about? What are the things that Jesus cared so much about he acted on? There are many things, but I think two of the most important things are this. One, Jesus cared about lost people. Jesus cared about lost people, people who were far from God, people who had lost their way in life. Great picture of this in Matthew's gospel, the ninth chapter. Jesus and his disciples had been traveling from village to village. They were binging from village to village, and every village they went in, they were surrounded by massive crowds, hundreds if not thousands. Imagine that day after day after day, surrounded with people. And I want you to notice how Jesus responded to those people. Matthew 9, 36, look at what it says. 
When he, talking about Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had what? What's that word? Compassion on them. Pause right there for a second. If we're honest, most of us would have to admit that when we see the crowds, we don't feel compassion. We feel inconvenienced. Right? Big crowds mean, well, you know, it's not going to be a parking space for me or, or the checkout line's going to be too long or all the toilet paper is going to be out of the store, right? We see the crowd and think about how the crowd impacts us. Jesus sees the crowd and immediately thinks, how can he impact the crowd? But why did Jesus have compassion on this particular crowd? Well, look at the rest of the verse. Here's why. Because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost people. They were hurting people. They were broken people. Having a heart like Jesus means we need to care about the people we like and the people we don't like. Having a heart like Jesus means we need to care about the people who help us and care about the people who need our help. Jesus cares about lost people. We need to care about lost people. But it doesn't end there. There's a second group of people that Jesus cared about, and that is found people. Jesus cares about found people. What do I mean by that? I mean people that are a part of his family. Believers who are in a relationship with God through Jesus. Look at what he says in Ephesians 5, 25. It says, Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her. This church is what Christ loved. Not this church, not this church. The people found people. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. Jesus loves his body. The Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus loves his bride. And if I'm going to have a heart like Jesus, I need to love the church as well. Sometimes I meet people and they'll say, well, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. I'm like, I'm sorry you've been hurt or have some image in your mind of what the church is like, but it don't work that way. It's not how this works. You can't say you love Jesus and not be willing to love the church that he died for and that he loves. You got to love the church. All of the church, not just our church. That's why one of our values as a church is that we never criticize other churches. No matter how different, what, how unique, if they are following Jesus as defined in the Bible, they are not our competition. They are not our enemy. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are to love and encourage and support them no matter how different they are from us. To have a heart like Jesus, I got to care about what Jesus cares about, and Jesus cares about people. Number two, the second thing I have to do to have a heart like Jesus is be indifferent to what he's indifferent to. To be indifferent to what Jesus is indifferent to. That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Seems weird to be talking about being indifferent, because you're like, well, as a Christ follower, Can we ever really be indifferent? As Jesus' followers, should we really be indifferent to anything? Yes. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus was indifferent to a lot of things. One of the things Jesus was indifferent to was man-made religious traditions. In fact, that's what the religious leaders tried to use all their rules and regulate things they had made up to try to manipulate and control Jesus. He just ignored them. He was completely indifferent to religious traditions. Jesus was also completely indifferent to other people's timetables. Look at Jesus' life. People are always trying to get him to speed up or slow down, to move on to the next town or stay in their town. It's like Jesus was deaf to them. He ignored them completely. He followed his father's timetable, not other people's pressure. Another thing Jesus was indifferent to, This may come as a shock. Politics. Jesus was indifferent to politics. How do I know that? Because most of the Jews expected their Messiah to be a political leader. 
like Moses, to get, who brought them out from under Pharaoh in Egypt, they were looking for a Messiah who would lead them out of bondage from the Roman Empire, their oppressors. They were looking for somebody to start a revolution. They were looking for their own Bernie Sanders to overthrow and change everything in their life. And so many times they would try to talk Jesus into starting a movement. He had huge crowds of people. Jesus' rallies were bigger than Trump's rallies. He had huge crowds of people. And people were always trying to say, you know, use that. Let's, let's use that political influence. And Jesus was completely indifferent to the use of political power. That's why when Pilate said, are you a revolutionary? Are you trying to overthrow the government? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of the next. It's a different kind of kingdom. Jesus was indifferent. In fact, Jesus was so indifferent, at times he came off as callous. Look at what he says to this guy in Luke chapter 9. It says, he, talking about Jesus, he said to another man, follow me. But he, the man, replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Legitimate request, right? Look at Jesus' reply. Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Sounds a little rude, right? I mean, does Jesus really not care about this man's grief, the loss of his father? No, obviously Jesus cares. We just talked about Jesus caring about hurting people. So what's going on here? We need to understand the context. First of all, just recognize that Jesus was God in the flesh. He would have known this man's heart. He would have known whether this is a legitimate issue or just an excuse to postpone following Jesus. Many scholars believe that the way the man phrased the statement indicated that his father was not yet dead. That it was probably going to happen. He was sick or he was old. And so the guy was saying, look, you know, I'd love to follow you, Jesus. I'd love to care about what you care about. But, you know, i got to take care of my family. I don't know how long it'll be. I think the biggest issue Jesus had with this guy is because in one breath he called Jesus Lord, and then the very next breath he said, me first. And that doesn't work with Jesus. You can't set, call Jesus Lord and then say, me first. Jesus is either Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. I mean, just the statement Jesus made, let the dead bury the dead. Can dead people bury dead people? No. No. So Jesus is obviously talking about spiritually dead people. He's saying the people of this world have things that are important to them, but if you follow me, you have a whole other set of priorities. You have to be indifferent to the stuff of the world to have a heart like Jesus. So what are some of the things that Jesus was indifferent to that we need to be indifferent to? Let me give you two of them. One impressing others. It's amazing how indifferent Jesus was to the opinions of other people, particularly the religious leaders. In fact, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Look at what Jesus said to them when they're trying to manipulate him. John 5, 41. Jesus says, your approval or disapproval means nothing to me. Imagine the power that statement could have in your life to free you up to live for the kingdom, not be controlled by the people around you. Another thing that Jesus was indifferent to, accumulating stuff. Jesus was indifferent to accumulating stuff. One day Jesus is preaching in a synagogue, and a man in the back jumps up and says, Jesus, make my brother share our father's inheritance with me. In other words, make him be fair. Make him do right. You know Jesus' response? I don't care what you care. Why are you asking me about that? I'm not a probate judge. This is none of my business. Does that mean Jesus doesn't care about being fair in life? No. Jesus just said it's about money and money's not that big a deal. Now is Jesus saying that stuff is bad? That if you have a car, a house, a boat, a vacation home, that you're a bad Christian? No. What Jesus is saying is found in Luke 12, 15. Look at what he says. Life is not measured by how much you own. See, the more you care about the stuff of this world, 
the less of a heart like Jesus you're going to have. Don't measure success in your life by the stuff you accumulate. He who dies with the most toys is still dead and must stand before Jesus and give an account of what you've done with what's been given to you. To have a heart like Jesus, we've got to care about what he cares about. Got to be indifferent to what he's indifferent to. And number three, this is really going to shock you. You got to get angry at what he gets angry about. To have a heart like Jesus, you got to get angry at what Jesus gets angry about. Now I know you're thinking, wait, 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 Philip. Anger, isn't that a sin? Isn't anger like one of the seven deadly sins? Not always. In fact, look at Ephesians 4, 26. It says, in your anger, do not sin. What's the inference of that verse? That sometimes your anger is a sin, but sometimes your anger is not a sin. It is not a sin to be angry. You know how I know that? Jesus got angry. And Jesus was without sin. Right? The best, most well-known example of Jesus getting angry is turning over the money changer tables in the temple court. Right? Palm Sunday, triumphal parade. Jesus leads that parade right to the temple and the temple courts courts where there are people selling and exchanging money. They're selling animals for sacrifice and they're exchanging money because you couldn't give Roman coins in the tithe in the temple. You had to exchange it. If it had any mark of Rome, that couldn't be given as your tithe to the temple. And If you were poor and didn't own flocks, you would have to buy animals, usually doves, to be sacrificed. That was not the problem Jesus had. That was a convenience. That was good. The problem was these merchants were taking advantage of the poor. They were price gouging in the temple courts. It's kind of like Disney World. You ever been to a concession stand inside of Disney World Park? It's like $12 for a small Coke, right? Because you're there. So that's what they were doing to the oppressed people. So Jesus shows up and he goes straight up hawk on them. He's turning over the tables. He's releasing the animals. He's driving them out with a whip. Why was Jesus doing that? What was it that made Jesus angry? And why was Jesus' anger not sinful? One, Because his anger was based on what was happening to others, not to himself. When my anger comes out of hurt that has come to me, that's sinful. When I get angry because of the injustices or pain of others, that's righteous anger. The other reason Jesus' anger wasn't a sin is because it wasn't impulsive. It was not an emotional response. One gospel tells us that before Jesus ran them out of the temple, he sat down and he made a whip. Now, I don't know how long it takes to make a whip, but I'm pretty sure it takes some time. My point is this. It wasn't an emotional quick reaction. It was a thoughtful decision Jesus made. Same thing's true for us. If Getting angry about what angers Jesus means our anger cannot be personal. It cannot be impulsive. So what are some of the things that Jesus got angry about? Well, there are several. Two, I think, are relevant to us. One, when children's needs go unmet. Jesus got really angry when children's needs went unmet. Great example of that is in the Gospel of Mark. You remember where the mothers of preschoolers brought their kids to Jesus for him to bless them? And the disciples went all secret service and, you know, blocked the way. He's too busy. He can't be bothered with children. It's that encounter where Jesus made that beautiful statement, let the little children come to me, right? We read that and we think it's this pretty little moment, but let me tell you something. Jesus was ticked off at his disciples. In fact, look at Mark 10, 14. It says, when Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. Some English translations say he was furious, and I know he was because you know the next thing he said? He said, if anybody harms a little child, it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and to be thrown into the sea. That's strong language. Jesus was angry when children's needs went unmet. If we're going to be the church, it should anger us when children's needs are unmet. That's why we as a church 
Invest the time and energy and effort and volunteers into Kids Creek and Center Point student ministry because we don't see our children as inconveniences that need to be warehoused while we're having church. They are the church. They matter to Jesus. They should matter to us. That's why we partner with Living Water Adopt a Child in Guatemala because they feed and provide medical and dental care for some of the most marginalized children on the planet. That's what it means to have a heart like Jesus. Second thing that Jesus got angry about often is when suffering is ignored. Jesus gets mad when suffering is ignored, when people in power turn a blind eye to the pain of people around them, when we walk past suffering people and pretend not to notice, it angers Jesus. Look at what he says, Luke eleven forty six. This is Jesus talking to the religious leaders who are ignoring the suffering of the people around him. It says, Jesus replied, woe to you. Anytime Jesus says woe, he's mad. Why? Because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves won't lift one finger to help him. So let me ask you, when you see the suffering of others, When you see injustice in our community, in our world, does it make you angry? Or you just say, well, it's not in my backyard. It's not affecting my family. It's not impacting my life. Can I tell you something? The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. And if we're going to have a heart like Jesus, we cannot be apathetic to the suffering of people around us. That's why we as a church take a special offering in the whole month of December to provide clean water. You know why? Because unclean water creates tremendous suffering in millions of people's lives. That's why we as a church have stepped in to take on this giant of human trafficking. You know why? Because human trafficking destroys people's lives. People are suffering. And having a heart like Jesus means I need to care about what he cares about. I need to be indifferent to the things he's indifferent to. And I need to be angry, righteous anger, at the injustices all around me. And then finally, number four, and maybe most importantly, to have a heart like Jesus, I got to sacrifice like Jesus sacrificed. I have to sacrifice like Jesus sacrificed. Let me put it this way. I will never grow up until I learn to give up. I will never grow spiritually until I'm willing to let go and give up the things that keep my hands and my heart and my head and my billfold and my calendar stuck in the stuff of this world. I have to let go of those things, to sacrifice those things I think are important, to grab hold of the stuff that Jesus said is truly important. Being the church means having a heart like Jesus, and that's a heart of sacrifice. Look at what Jesus says about himself in Mark 10, 45. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom, as a sacrifice for many. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice on Calvary's cross. To reconcile and to capture us and to gather us and to restore us to Jesus. He gave it all up for us. Chances are you'll never be asked to die to save another person. You're probably never going to have an opportunity to rush in front of a, a speeding bus to save a child and give up your own life. But I can tell you this, every day. You face opportunities to sacrifice for the good of others. To sacrifice your time, your talent, your treasure. To sacrifice your preferences for the betterment of the people around you. And so rather than giving you examples of how Jesus sacrificed, I've just put a single blank line on the bottom of your outline. And this is what I want to ask you to do. To write in there, One thing 
you could sacrifice this week to serve another. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe sacrificing a little bit of your time at work to spend a little more time with your kids. Maybe it's sacrificing a little bit of that talent that you have that God gave you that's helping you earn a good salary and put money in the bank for the future. Maybe you could sacrifice a little bit of that talent to serve God by serving here in his church. Maybe you could sacrifice financially to give to the mission and vision that God has called Cedar Creek Church to, to expand the kingdom of God and bring the good news of hope to many. I don't know what you could sacrifice. I just know you got to sacrifice if you want a heart like Jesus. So what I'm saying is, if and when you write something in that blank, it's a commitment you're making to God. It's not a commitment to me. It's not a commitment to your church family. This is between you and God. This is about committing something to God to grow a heart like Jesus. Because remember, right where we started, the eyes of the Lord are searching the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. As you're thinking about what you're going to write down there, let me just share this last verse, Luke 9, 24. Jesus said, those who want to save their lives will give up true life. But those who give up, sacrifice their lives for me, will have true life. That's what I want my life to be. And because I love you, that's what I want your life to be as well. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning you, your word has been crystal clear about the condition of our hearts and what needs to change. I know your spirit, your Holy Spirit has been speaking into our lives right now, our circumstances. But God, I also know that transforming our heart is not something we could do on our own. If we had the power to change, we'd have been changed a long time ago. We recognize collectively that we need your power. As we make these commitments to you, we know we need your power to keep those commitments. So whatever we are writing down, whatever we are planning to change in this coming week, we confess collectively, we need you, Jesus. We need you. And so, Father, would you pour out your spirit? Would you pour out your power on your people, the church you loved and died for? so that we could have hearts more in tune with you and less in tune with this world around us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.